right, well, thanks uh, for joining me here. I'm Kevin Lynch, uh, CTO at Adobe, and I was asked to come share some thoughts about emerging technologies and where I saw software going. And I looked at some of the themes of the conference, and I put together a bit of a mashup of, uh, of a few different themes. And, um, and you can see my title's a little overloaded, too. Uh, and I've narrowed these down into three, three things that I think are interesting uh, right now uh, to talk about uh, in terms of where I see things going. Uh, one is designing more sustainably. Um, the other is many data points are in the world right now. You're trying to understand information. How can you better visualize uh, information and gain more knowledge from it? And then we have a challenge of many screens that people are interacting with, and how can we really effectively design uh, for all these screens? And where we're at right now um, at Adobe is many of the things that you're interacting with during your daily life uh, have actually been touched by Adobe software. Uh, a lot of design, like these signs I imagine were designed probably with Adobe software, uh, water bottle labels, uh, the little placemats with the Fairmont logo, you know, those are all things that were likely touched by uh, people using tools uh, from Adobe. And so uh, we have an interesting role to play in helping people design uh, things more sustainably. And this has been a long relationship with designers, uh, and we're definitely hearing about sustainability more as something that they'd like to see the tools uh, to help them uh, design better with. And at Adobe, uh, this sustainability has been uh, through our daily life uh, in our buildings. And during the last uh, kind of economic crisis in 2001, uh, we were looking for ways to save money. And sustainability and energy management in our buildings actually came from looking at reducing our costs. And we've actually now have uh, uh, our buildings LEED certified. They're platinum. Uh, they have the big Energy Star logo on the building. And uh, they're great at managing uh, energy now. And uh, we even have you know, like no flush toilets and things like that. So on a daily basis, you know, engineers at Adobe are reminded about sustainability. Um, and uh, I work in the San Francisco office, and the building that we are in there uh, is over 100 years old, and we actually just got it also LEED certified. Uh, so it's um, got sealed windows, and it's got good energy management, and the lights go off when you're not in the room and everything like that. Uh, so uh, we're actually finding across the company that we're saving uh, over a million dollars now annually uh, just by uh, managing our energy better. And the systems we put in to do this are paying back in uh, about nine months. So it's a very uh, economical thing to do as well as the right thing to do uh, for the environment. So as we've been looking at uh, ways we can help people uh, design more sustainably, we actually hosted a round table at Adobe in this building to talk with designers about what some of the issues are that they saw for designing sustainably and how we might be able to help. And I, I have a short video clip here of uh, some of the points being made during that little summit. The best way I could think of visualizing it is this kind of hairball of knowledge. So essentially, what our industry has in resources is a lot of specialized knowledge, a lot of really, really good knowledge, but it's largely decentralized, it's not integrated, and it's often inaccessible. People are constantly asking what to do. Just tell me what to do. Almost like this is one time that designers are re like have reserved to not have an opinion. They just really want to know what to do. Okay, just you figure it out for me. There's a lot of that. And so, um, I mean, I think that Gabi made the, the point very well, which is it's not that we don't have the information, it's that we don't have the right filters. I, I just want to respond to the word sustainability. It's boring. It's not aspirational. I mean, it needs to be rebranded. It's like, you don't go out and go, you know, say to somebody, go out and sustain. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's just, it's not, you know, it, it's not like growth, you know, with the CEO. We need to grow. We need to, you know, we need revenue to grow. It's sustained, you know. So I, I think there's a branding issue. So designers are starting to really grapple with uh, what does this mean for them and how can they actually get the data as they're designing these things to do uh, more of the right thing. And uh, there's a couple of good points of view that came out of that discussion that, that we hosted. One was uh, designing backwards, which is basically, uh, this is something coming from Celery Design, uh, Brian Doherty, and he's actually, he's written a book about this as well, uh, which is a great way of learning uh, how people are, are seeing this challenge now. And uh, the point of view here is about thinking about the destiny of the item first, 
uh, before you think about the initial use of the item. So how is this thing going to actually uh, affect the environment after uh, it's been discarded and go from the landfill, if you will, uh, back up uh, to the front end of the process and then everything in between? Uh, that's a reversal of how most people are thinking about design today. Uh, and in fact, most uh, you know, don't understand or don't think enough about what are all these follow-on uh, steps after the item has been designed and what is the actual impact. And this is going even further than that and saying start with the impact uh, and then uh, factor your design around that. So there's starting to be some real uh, good experiences in thinking around how to uh, address these challenges. And there's a group called the Designers Accord, and this is uh, at designersaccord.org, and it has about 100,000 designers now who are participating in this uh, across about 100 countries around the world. And it's kind of like the Kyoto Treaty of Design. You know, it's, it's really what is the philosophy of designing for the least impact to the environment. Uh, what techniques can we use that's sharing uh, knowledge, experience, resources uh, to help people design more effectively and carry the impact uh, aspect of design into the discussion with clients so that that becomes primary in discussion uh, rather than either an afterthought or, or not really considered. Um, and so it's real, really about having an open conversation about doing that uh, and being very active in bringing that, that story uh, to, the, to the top. So Designers Accord is a good sign of how uh, the, the web community is really starting to come around this, this challenge. So we started thinking, um, well, what can we do to help inside tooling? Uh, since a lot of designers are using uh, the, the software to create uh, these, these objects, uh, what can we do to kind of make that better uh, for them, to give them more insight? And so uh, we put together some mock-ups here of, of things that we're thinking about. Uh, these are not features in any software that I know about. Uh, these are ideas that we're having right now, and we're getting feedback on them to see if they're useful or not. Um, and I'm interested in anything uh, you guys have uh, along these lines in terms of thoughts. Uh, in, this, in this idea here, uh, starting with the initial planning of a project and laying out, for example, a, a, a box uh, job here where you're creating some packaging, uh, optimizing the layout of the packaging on the printed material can save paper. Uh, and that's something that isn't really visible in the design process right now. Usually you're designing the one item and you don't really think about how is that going uh, to be uh, uh, produced during print production and actually minimize paper usage. So that's something we could visualize more uh, in the upfront planning of, of actually producing some of these, these objects. Another thing is the materials that people are using. So um, this is a, a, an example of designing a, a package and it's got uh, some uh, re recycled uncoated paper that, that we're using here. Uh, but the ink, this orange ink that's on the box, uh, it actually is a, has some toxicity that's beyond the guidelines that the designer would like to be designing to. And right now, when you're choosing colors and design, uh, you know, you don't really have any insight into what the chemical composition or the impact of those colors really will be on the environment. You know, what's the environmental destiny of this color orange? It, that just doesn't show up uh, in, in, in the design process. You know, like, these signs are really, really cool in that green is nice, but is that a toxic green or is it uh, okay green? Uh, you know, I'm sure uh, that's not obvious during the process of creating it. So how can we surface that information more uh, at the beginning of the design process? So again, you're choosing more with thought towards uh, the end of this uh, product's life. There's a couple of other ideas in here about uh, even having panels in design software that show the impact of your design. So an impact palette uh, where you can choose a standard you'd like to design to. Uh, for ex this one, for example, is showing you're, you're designing to the Designers Accord standards. Uh, you might want to design to the Greenpeace standards or uh, Society of Concerned Scientists or other organizations who uh, might uh, have some judgment about what is uh, good or not good about different aspects of, of, uh, of products that you're designing. And uh, right now, one of the challenges is that there's many different points of view. Uh, you know, which colors are toxic is a kind of controversial topic. Uh, there's different points of view about how toxic different compositions are. So uh, it's hard for designers to know what to do. So having some standards that they can choose from will be helpful. And then actually surfacing where your design deviates from those standards. In this case, you can see the, uh, you know, the waste cost of this, uh, of this box is too high and it's throwing a little yellow flag. And the process being used here is offset lithography, uh, which is shown as a red dot because the impact of the environment of that is much worse than other ways of processing the print job. Um, so again, showing this stuff earlier. And here in the last step of packaging a job to be sent to manufacturing, uh, there is more that I think we could do 
as an industry to show uh, the impact of that job before it actually goes to uh, production. So in this case, reviewing, uh, you know, what are the inks being used? Are they soy-based inks or not? Uh, what's the paper that's being used? What's the quantity? How many trees is this impacting? Uh, you know, that should be highly visible during that uh, upfront production process so you really can understand uh, the, uh, not only the benefits of the product you're creating, but the impact of, of that product. So, and then the most challenging thing uh, for uh, designers overall is just not creating things. Uh, designers like to create. Um, and so producing a lot of these objects, uh, it, in some cases, maybe it's not even necessary to produce those objects. And that's where I think uh, we can make even more progress. You know, are you sure you want to really create this? Um, you know, one example is uh, there was a, a company who was taking on a, a green agenda, and we were hearing this from one of the participants in the, in the summit, and they're producing an annual report talking about uh, the moves they've been making to be more green. And of course, their annual report was a you know, four-color print job on shiny, glossy paper. And, uh, and they started realizing that was uh, not consistent, of course, with the goals that they were trying to talk about in, in terms of the rest of their business. And they went not only from uh, using recycled paper, they went beyond that and said, why are we even printing this out and mailing it at all? Uh, and they went to uh, using an online uh, version of their annual report, which had all the great design work, uh, but didn't uh, kill any trees. And so the not creating uh, option is one that can be hard to engage with, especially if your job is to create stuff. Um, and so what alternatives do you have to creating the object that someone's asked you to make? Maybe you could make something else that has uh, dramatically less impact than the thing that you've been uh, tasked to do. So raising that as a designer is, uh, is, can be challenging uh, to question uh, the mission, uh, if you will, uh, as well as just you know, what color things should be and how big they should be and things like that. So the next part of my loosely connected uh, three themes is many data points. And we're increasingly overwhelmed with information. Uh, the information overload is not uh, sustainable, if you will. You can't keep it all in your head. You can't keep up with all the threads that, that, that are coming at you. And that's a challenge. And so I think there's a lot more we can do to help visualize information more efficiently. And I've got a few examples here that I'll show you. And I, I've picked them all around uh, visualizing information around sustainability. So the, the first one I want to show you here is something that's called NewsMap. And this is a, an application that is running on a server in Japan right now. And it's analyzing news stories. And it's showing you a tree map of the stories so you can understand uh, which of these stories uh, is more important than the others in terms of uh, views and, and links to them. Uh, and you can see less important ones are smaller. And I can do queries here, uh, like environment. And as it's actually doing this query, it's now searching all these different uh, news uh, sources and countries for information uh, on that particular topic. And you can see it raises uh, uh, more important stories up at the top here. But one, I can turn off uh, countries, or I can turn off topics like business. I can turn off, and it will recalculate and show me just stories uh, that are omitting uh, the, the business category, which it seems like that's pretty much all of them. Uh, so we get rid of some more of those here. And you can see it's, it's bouncing some more up. And so here's one that's, for example, an activist arrested for a custard attack. Uh, and uh, he's an environmental ac activist throwing custard. So that came up to the top uh, because we're able to actually uh, do these searches in a way that was more of a visual way of understanding the importance of these different articles. Uh, another example I'd like to show you here is something that's called spatial key. And what this is doing is enabling you to take data uh, from a spreadsheet, like from Excel, and map that data onto uh, geographic locations. And so here, I'll log in. And um, so here we've got some data. Uh, there's crime data. There's funding data. There's pollution and things like that. So we'll open up one of these here. And this is a spreadsheet uh, where uh, the individual items have been geotagged, like they had a zip code on them or they had an address associated with them. And you can take that data, in this case pollution, and you can map it. Uh, automatically onto uh, uh, the picture of the Earth here. And you can see the impact graphically. So you're not just looking at a rows and columns of data now. You're actually seeing a nice heat map showing that data uh, geocoded onto the, onto, the, onto the screen here. And if I want to, I can choose different visualizations. Uh, so here's, I've, I've got brighter and darker. Uh, if I want to, of course, I can, I can zoom out. And you can get a bigger view of, of North America. And there's the heat map of pollution uh, across kind of North America and a bit of South America here. And you can see uh, where it's more and less dense. Um, 
And if I want to just look at the higher impact ones, I can, I can change the slider here to actually increase or decrease the amount of uh, which levels of data are shown here. And you can overlay multiple data. You can say, where is it? A lot of pollution and a lot of crime. Uh, and you can uh, do different ways to visualize it using uh, circles, heat grid, heat map. Um, and this was built with uh, Flex running on Flash. And on the back end of this is Amazon EC2, which is actually doing uh, the processing of the data and then feeding it uh, to the client here for visualization. And then I can go and I can click on uh, these areas. And you can see here is La Paz. It's one of the areas where more of the pollution is happening. So that's one way of doing kind of more interactive visualization, more graphical visualization of, of this data so that you can explore and understand it more easily. Um, and that's made, this is made by a company called Universal Mind, uh, it's spatial key. The next one I wanted to show is something where uh, we're starting to do more meetings online uh, and traveling less. And there's a number of technologies you can use to do that. Uh, this one is Connect. And it's something we use at Adobe. And I can go into a, a room here, um, if, if the meeting will start. Hopefully Ian's online and he'll open, he'll let me in. Um, and what we're doing now is the Connect meetings let you share audio and video and data and slides and everything with people remotely so you can see them and interact. And there's now uh, a third party who's added an extension to Connect so that you can build your own uh, extensions to it to actually analyze the environmental impact of having met without traveling. How much money have you saved? Uh, you know, how much CO2 have you not used? Oh, am I on the wrong? This one? Or am I on the wrong network? Maybe I'm trapped inside this network, I'm not sure. OK, we'll skip that one. Um, one of the great things about that is you can actually see by the IP address uh, where people are located who are in the meeting virtually. And it automatically calculates uh, the flight cost from getting one place to another and the CO2 saved uh, from not having flown from one location to another. And you can track that historically as well. So you can see like, how much your sales team is saving, for example. I might be able to show you some of that uh, back end stuff. Yeah, here we go. So here you can see by using uh, online meetings, uh, these different groups here have saved a certain amount of CO2. Uh, and here's the number of meetings that they've had. And so inside of a company, you can look at how well your groups are saving money and uh, helping the environment by not traveling uh, while still having these meetings remotely. In fact, you can track uh, this over time here. You can get nice graphs of how people are doing. Uh, these can be widgets that you can embed in your web page. So uh, your department inside your company or your public web page, you can put a badge that says, you know, here's how much CO2 I have saved this year by not flying to meetings. Uh, here's how much money I have saved. And we're seeing inside Adobe uh, that's being virally adopted right now. And different groups like sales now puts that on their internal intranet page. And other groups are starting to do that because they want to see who's saving the most uh, money by actually doing this. Um, so here's, here's a, one of the sales trips here. I can open it up. And you can see the, this is a real meeting uh, that sales had with people around the world at Adobe. And you can see where the people are attending uh, the sales meeting from. And you can see uh, the cost savings per person attendee and the carbon savings. Um, and this is visible in the meeting while it's happening. Uh, and it's uh, reported, of course, after, so you can see historically how you've been doing. Um, and, uh, and that's created by uh, this company that's called Refine Data. And Refine Data basically created this extension for Connect. And uh, Connect actually has a free version, too. You can go to acrobat.com, and you, you don't have to pay to do the uh, online meeting. You can just do it for free. Um, so that's, I think, a great example of how visualizing the impact of doing your meetings that way can help uh, justify doing them that way. The, the last example I wanted to show is this, this thing that's more about augmented reality. So uh, trying to visualize things in really new ways. Um, and this is an example from GE. And they've really pushed uh, what Flash Player can do here, where they've created uh, uh, the smart grid demonstration. And they do it using uh, the video camera. And here I'm going to allow the camera to turn on. So here I am, all right? um, which isn't that impressive because you can see me too. But um, Now what I'm going to do is uh, this is a piece of paper that you can print out from that website. And this paper is actually going to have uh, something 
animate out of this piece of paper and show uh, as I hold it in front of the camera. So it's going to augment this with some online reality. So, so here I'm going to put it in front of my screen. You can see it's detected, uh, the piece of paper is there. And as I'm moving the paper around, you can see that this little online world as the Golden Gate Bridge and the sun and things is actually tracking the paper uh, as I'm moving it around. So this is, uh, this is pretty fun. Now, you can see the wind uh, turbines are spinning a little bit, but if I blow in my microphone, actually, I can make them spin faster. Let's see that. <laughs> so you can play with this at home, too, if you want. Just go, go to their website. So, so this is a pretty crazy uh, you know, example that I'm starting to see uh, happen now, where you're augmenting the, the physical experience with the, with the online experience. And uh, Tops is doing this now, um, too, with with baseball cards. So you can get a baseball card by a you know, particular baseball player. I don't follow baseball that much, but uh, you can hold the baseball card up to your video camera and the character will come out in 3D of the card and you know, swing their bat or whatever. Uh, and so this is kind of a really new way of starting to understand information. It's being used really playfully uh, right now and I think uh, there's a lot of potential for this to be, uh, to be even more, more widely used for understanding uh, data and blending the physical world with the, with the online world. So those are some of the visualization examples that, that I think are interesting right now. And the, the third part of, of my, my uh, multi-part piece here is many screens. And, and this is an interesting challenge where we're now in a world where uh, there's many different form factors of devices that people are interacting with, whether that's your, your, your PC, your smartphone, a television set, and creating experiences that actually work reliably across these environments is really hard right now. Um, and the challenge that we're looking at is how can we enable people to create an experience that actually works well across these different form factors, these different environments, and takes into consideration the, the constraints and the capabilities of each one, uh, but uh, is actually you know, a single piece of content or a, an, an application that you could actually install and run or, or browse to across all these devices. This is something that is very difficult to do today. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about how to enable people to create experiences that, uh, that do uh, work this way. And one of the approaches that, that I think is important is starting not from uh, the big screen desktop experience and then trying to make that work on other devices, uh, which is tempting because that's what a lot of people are designing for today is big screens and personal computers. Uh, but the world has now changed. Uh, there's now more uh, mobile devices connected to the internet than there are personal computers. Uh, the sales of, of personal computers now is dwarfed uh, each year by the sales of smartphones and, and um, other mobile phones. Uh, PCs are about 25% of consumer electronics sales last year. Uh, the rest is uh, set-top boxes, cell phones, things like that, that are connected to the internet. Uh, so the world is now different. Uh, we still experience the internet primarily uh, here with our laptops. Some are starting to move to smartphones. Um, but uh, in terms of how the world has connected to the net now, uh, that world is now different. And so we need to start thinking about how to design for that new world of multi-screen. And I think the approach that is going to be important here is to start uh, by designing for the more constrained environments and then enabling those experiences to work uh, on the more uh, capable devices. And so I call this the cone of compatibility. Uh, and this is basically starting at the bottom with the most constrained uh, device set, and then like feature phones, going to smartphones, going to ultra mobile PCs, to desktop computers, to televisions. Uh, these have different uh, characteristics, uh, but generally if you design something for the bottom of the cone, uh, our goal is to make that same thing work on everything up the cone. Um, not necessarily the other way around though. And I think from a design perspective, it's going to mean really thinking about designing for mobile first. Uh, right now, mobile is a, a secondary thought or a side effort uh, after creating a bigger experience. And what I'm starting to see is that really needing to change. And we're starting to change that way, uh, the way we make software at Adobe. Uh, so for example, Flash Player, we're now designing for mobile and, and desktop at the same time rather than uh, doing mobile after. Um, and our applications that we're making that are their new web applications, we're starting to look at, okay, let's create the the mobile version of this thing, and then think about the PC version. Um, and that's, a, that's a big change uh, for us and for the whole ecosystem of people designing, designing this stuff. So we, we created a little example of, a, of an application, uh, and this is just a concept piece, it's not like a shipping application. Um, 
and it's just called Adobe Notes. And we, we chose note taking as a really simple use case that we could explore what it meant to be a multi-screen application uh, just for the little uh, task of taking notes. Um, so we put together a, a prototype of it to start learning about this. And the, the first one that we did ha here actually is the mobile version of the application, which I'm not sure if you can see on the screen there. So if we could switch to the Elmo, or we have, oh, great, okay, it's just me that, okay. Um, so here's a little application. It's uh, running here on the, on the phone. It's got a touch screen. This is an HTC device. Uh, the app is running on Flash on the device, um, and I can do a list. So here I've got a shopping list I can open up. Um, I can go back to the home screen here, go to another one. So you can see I've got three simple notes here. Um, I can, if I want, you know, get a little insertion point here, and I can type something. Um, like I can add an item, uh, you know, get. Get a hat. Um, and so I can add that item to the list here, and I can close the keyboard, and I can manage this on my phone. Now, the interesting thing here is what happens to this application on other screens? So uh, this Notes app, if I wanted to use it on my personal computer, I'm going to go back uh, to my PC here on my Mac, and we have uh, now that same application running on uh, the desktop computer. I'm going to launch it here, and this is running on... Uh, Macintosh, can you see that up there now? Okay. Um, and it has the same notes that I was looking at over there. It's the same application. You can see I've got the list of notes. Um, it's uh, able to run on my computer as a standalone app. It's actually running on Air here, which has Flash inside of it. And I can do the same thing as I was doing over there. I can press on it, and you can see it gets bigger, and I can see the list. I can close it and go back. I can go and see that one. It's very similar to the interactivity that we saw on the phone, uh, but there's some subtle differences. Uh, some of the affordances are in different places, like uh, the controls for adding new notes are on the top here. On the mobile device, they're on the bottom. Uh, and that has to do with what people expect on personal computers versus the kind of soft keys on mobile phones. Uh, you notice when I click on an item here, it opens the note up by doing a little uh, smooth animation to the next view. On the mobile device, it just switched instantly. Um, and that was because the processing power on the mobile phones aren't quite what your PC processing power is. And so you can do these subtle differences in effect and design. The other is, uh, since this is a desktop app, I can, I can take this note and I can drag it out of the list. And there I've got it on my screen as another note. Um, and I can do that with these other ones. And so this enables me to use the, the screen real estate of the PC in a way that doesn't make sense to do on the device. Uh, but it's the same application, and it has the capability when you're on the Mac, and it doesn't when you're over there. Um, now, another aspect of this is I can actually um, edit these things while uh, they're connected, and they stay in sync. So uh, this is something we've learned about making these multi-screen apps, is data synchronization is totally key. Uh, you can see it says get hat here, uh, which I just typed in. But if we can put both of them on the screen, or are they already? If we can put the mobile one up and the PC one up, you can see that they're going to be synchronized. I'm sorry, I can't see the screen, so please uh, make some sound or something. All right. So here's the uh, list here on the mobile device, and here's the list on the PC, and um, so I can go and, you know, here's another item. And hopefully that will uh, synchronize. There we go. So it's synchronized on the device as well. And it's actually synchronizing on a, uh, a data as I'm typing on either one. If I go over to this one, and I can type on this one, um, and I'll bring up the keyboard. And you can see I'm deleting some of this word here. Uh, and you can see it's all updating almost in real time on the other version of the application. And so there's no, uh, there's no saving of the document. Uh, there's, there's, uh, it's just live all the time. And when you're editing the content, uh, it's staying in sync constantly. And uh, that, we think, is going to be a characteristic of these multi-screen apps, is keeping your data uh, available and consistent with you wherever you are without having to go through laborious process uh, to keep that up to date. Uh, the, another example of this is running the application inside the web browser. So uh, here I'm going to open up that, that same thing, uh, the same application, uh, 
and it's now running in the browser, because Flash is in the browser too, and so that same app can run here. Now notice it uses a pretty much the same uh, layout as this one on the desktop. It doesn't have the close buttons because it's not a desktop app now, it's in the web uh, browser, so there's some minor differences. Um, you can see it lays out on a horizontal layout rather than a vertical layout inside the browser because your browser tends to be as big as your display. Most people have it really big. Um, so when you view notes as just a list like the other ones, it doesn't use the real estate of the screen very well. So here's where the design has again adapted itself flexibly to take advantage of the browser context, uh, whereas you know, in the desktop context, uh, we have a, still a vertical list like on mobile, and we have the ability to drag them around. Um, so this is the design exploration we're doing right now is what makes sense in each of these different contexts, uh, what happens when this note-taking application is on your television set? Uh, how do you want to see notes on your TV? Do you want to see notes on your TV? Uh, you might, um, like, what show was I going to watch? Uh, what time is it on? You might want to see that on your TV. So, um, and, uh, so this is kind of a, an example of some of the experiments that we're doing uh, to, to learn about this new design frontier of working across multiple screens. So the last bit here is, as we're doing this, uh, this effort to enable this consistent environment across screens, uh, there's a lot of design challenges, uh, but there's also a lot of technical challenges to get a consistent runtime out and enable a content and applications to be available across these devices in an open way. Um, and to do that, that's something that we just can't go do ourselves. Uh, it's not just a matter of engineering. Uh, it's also a matter of partnering and working effectively across a wide variety of device manufacturers, carriers, uh, hardware uh, uh, chip makers, uh, content producers, media companies, to enable uh, this, this vision of having uh, this ability to access your content and applications across screens consistently. So we're doing that in something called the Open Screen Project. Uh, where we have a number of partners today. These are some of the, the folks that are uh, signed up and working with us in Open Screen Project uh, to enable this vision to come uh, into reality. And uh, we're working hard on it right now, and it's uh, uh, the, based on getting a Flash Player and the Air runtime across uh, smartphones, uh, PCs, uh, set-top boxes, game consoles, other devices, televisions, which, which are now uh, starting to become network connected uh, to enable this reality to happen. So we're busy working on, on uh, trying to make that, that real. And um, so those were kind of a few of the thoughts I put together uh, about sustainable design, uh, visualizing information, trying to get this stuff to work across, across many different form factors. So uh, a bit of a mashup. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take uh, any questions you might have or any feedback or ideas. Yes, and I think if you step to the mic, it would be, it would be good if that's... So one of the things, I can be loud. Oh, there you go. That's loud too. Yep. Um, I love the fact that you start the, the cone of, of going up, starting from the basics. Uh, and you hit on a really big point that the screen drives a different interaction in each size. One thing that, you, that hasn't come up yet, and I find I'm struggling with my day-to-day -day work, is the interface also changes in each of those devices. Um, and in my past experience in working with Flash to prototype mobile experiences, you start to run out of fingers you can use. <laughs> um, whereas Apple now allows you to use multiples, and other people are rolling that out as well. So, and you start having other sensors involved, accelerometers, yep. things like that. How are you conceptualizing how the interface changes in addition yep. to the screen size for those experiences? Right, yeah. The different input devices uh, are one of the aspects of the challenge of multi-screen. So some devices have keyboards, uh, some have uh, soft keys, some have touch screens, others have mice, some don't. Um, some have remote control. Uh, so. How do we map these input methods in a consistent way as we can to the application? So for example, uh, going right and left you know, to view a photo or to whatever, switch between something. Uh, could be arrow keys on, on one uh, platform. It could be a swipe gesture on another. It could be the remote control uh, you know, channel changer on, on one. Uh, so what we're aiming to do is where we can uh, build some consistency, like in that example, mapping all those things to the same event inside Flash. Uh, is the approach that we're taking. So we're trying to model uh, as consistent an event model as we can, an input method to those events, uh, so that you can abstract it and say, okay, I want to go to the next. And that next may be right arrow key, or maybe swipe gesture, or whatever. So that's what we're aiming to do there. Um, but there's definitely some tricky bits there that are to be figured out. Um, and how consistent can we make 
especially in the in touch screens and multi-touch screens, how can we make gestures more consistent across these devices? Because we're already starting to see some fragmentation in gestures. Uh, so as a user, it's really confusing. You know, what happens when I do that? And what happens when I swipe? And um, that, that stuff is, uh, needs to be worked out. Uh, so we'll, we'll play a role. Others are, are doing that too. Um, but yeah, that's the, that is part of the wild frontier. Um, the others are, uh, what, what, what about capabilities on some devices and not others? Like some devices know where you are and some don't. Uh, some can let you access the, you know, the address book and some can't. Uh, so how consistent can we make those things? Uh, you know, like today, right now, on mobile devices, many applications uh, can access your address book because uh, it's kind of a well-known thing on mobile phones. Uh, but on desktop computers, we don't see that as much. Uh, and I think that's an example of where I'd like to see us help play that role of making that more consistent. So if you make an app that uses your contacts, why can't you use your contacts on a PC too? Like the address book on the Mac, for example, or Outlook on Windows. So that's the kind of stuff we're trying to do is create that consistent layer uh, as best we can across these devices. Yeah. Yes. Um, hi. So with the, the last bit about many screens, uh, I think that's cool stuff technologically. Um, I, I feel like it only has an indirect impact on sustainability stuff, just uh -huh. in the yep. sense that it might be able to replace some paper that you yep. you know would otherwise write yourself notes on or stuff. Yep. But um, it, it, se it seems that um, the the real design problem, if your if your goal is sustainability, is uh, for Adobe, you're in a great position to do things like eliminate paper. Um, uh, you know, office paper, magazines, newspapers, mm -hmm. stuff like yep. that. And so what kind of research have you guys done on um, basically what the interfaces of, what, what interface paper has that's better than digital yep. that you guys could emulate in, in the digital world? Yes, that's a great question. And um, uh, the uh, PDF was uh, something we've been doing for a long time, obviously, um, 15 years now, I think. And the hope there was that more documents would actually become electronic and not be printed. Uh, we haven't yet seen that full transformation happen right now. Um, even forms, we had a big focus on forms because that's a lot of uh, uh, process is based around printed forms and people filling them out. Uh, we did electronic forms. And what we were finding is the, the workflow uh, tends to break down because there's so many people involved in the paper process. And any one of them requires a piece of actual paper. It, it breaks down and you've printed it out again. Uh, and one example of that is uh, people had been creating uh, electronic forms with PDF, sending them to uh, someone to fill them out. And there's interactive fields. You know, you can type things in. You don't have to print it. Uh, but some people felt like they wanted to do that. So they would print it out, fill in the form, and, um, uh, or even, even fill out the, uh, the information by typing it in and then print out the results of that and mail it back. Uh, and so we, we've, we've been trying to address each of those different kind of obstacles. And in that case, uh, now we've got this thing where if you type in stuff into a form, it, will, it can actually capture a barcode ID uh, of uh, the information that you just typed in. Uh, so at least it, on, the, on the recipient side, again, you can put it back in the digital world easily by scanning the barcode. Um, but it's a people process that everyone has to kind of buy into the electronic flow in order for it to work. Uh, you know, we're, we're working with the uh, South African uh, revenue uh, department, Internal Revenue Service, basically in South Africa. And they're having a problem because they have so much paper uh, that they're, they're storing it in these concrete buildings. And it's actually stressing the concrete in the building because the paper is so heavy. And it keeps uh, escalating uh, because any activity related to a person's finances ends up photocopying these pieces of paper uh, and sending it out and then getting it back and keeping that and then copying it again. Uh, and so they're now embarking uh, on, on digitizing that, which is taking a, quite a big effort. Uh, and uh, they're creating an electronic application for filing your taxes that doesn't involve paper at all. So they've created a, actually it's an application built on air that they're distributing to all the citizens in South Africa who are filing taxes. And there is no paper form now. Uh, there is just the application. And, um, and the app has also reduced complexity where the, the tax forms were you know, uh, many pages long. I think it was 140 pages if you had all these different things. Uh, now you can do, you know, the, like the easy version, it's two pages, electronic, and then it expands dynamically depending on what options you've chosen. So, uh, so I'm seeing some promising progress on that, but boy, I, I still see people kind of clinging to paper, and uh, uh, I wish it were different. Uh, I, think as, I think the focus now on sustainability uh, is really bringing home to people that it, it's, it's not you know, just 
wasteful or expensive to do paper or inefficient, uh, it also is just terrible for the future of mankind. And so I think that will put more you know, emphasis. I think technically we've got great solutions to not, to not use paper. So, but the paperless office has not yet become a reality. Uh, it's just the opposite, really. Um, so, yeah. I mean, the print dialogues, and you know, maybe we should, before you print, say, are you sure? <laughs> uh, right. uh, more email I get now, actually, on the footer says, think before you print this email. I, you know, I think that's good. I, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's where I think it's at. Yeah. Just had a quick question um, with regards to your notes application and, and this idea of designing. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what you were saying. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. So just a question about the, the notes application that you demoed and this idea of designing for the small screen then to the large yeah. screen. From a developer point of view and a workflow point of view, do you see us getting more um, reuse out of our code in this um, new environment as well? I'm sorry, the last part? The Do reuse I... of code, particularly in that application that you demoed, the, the notes sort of thing, how, you know, from a developer point of view, not just from a design point of view, but... Um... Yes, right. So from a developer point of view, creating an application like that is uh, exactly what we're looking at. Um, it's the design constraints of doing that, but then also how do you reuse code across uh, those different screens? And it's, uh, it's an interesting challenge. And the way they're approaching it, the notes app right now, is um, it's built with the Flex framework and you can subclass elements of the framework. And so what it's actually doing is the different versions of the notes application, it's one binary, but depending on where it's running, it uses different subclasses of windowing, for example, so the controls show up here or they show up down there, uh, so that as an engineer you can still have the same interactivity and patterns and business logic, if you will, of interacting with the app, uh, but the presentation uh, can actually vary depending on which one you're running. But it's all, it's the same binary and it changes dynamically by changing which subclass is shown on the screen. Um, so yeah, it's very much how do you engineer these things once and have them work uh, as well as factor in these design considerations. Um, and then over time we'll look at, okay, what patterns are emerging for how people are building apps across these and then how can we put that in the framework so that it happens more by default. Like if you have a control bar and we know control bars like to show up on the bottom on mobile and they like to show up at the top on, on, on desktop computers, can we make that happen automatically uh, so you don't have to actually engineer that at all. Um, or do people not want that to happen? And so, so that exploration is, is part of what's going on right now. But yeah, the, definitely the goal is how do you build content applications once and then have them adapt to the things that they're viewed on? And I think that the, the development challenge there is very much designing in the constraints of the most constrained ones so it will work there. Then how do you take advantage of the greater capabilities when those are available? Like you have more RAM or you have a bigger screen. That's the interesting development challenge too. And how do you get insight into that? So we work on something called Device Central, which uh, is in the software we're producing right now. It's in Creative Suite. And um, you can actually take the, the app you're developing and you can run it on a variety of different devices in Device Central. And you can see the memory use. You can, you can actually simulate the performance of the device. Uh, you can even do, uh, from a design perspective, you can do screen glare overlays on your application. So when you're outside, you know, what is that like? Uh, you can turn on wireless uh, connectivity and off so that you can see what happens to your application. Um, you can change the power level and see what that does. So um, that kind of simulation of your application running uh, is one of the, one of the in really critical things to have when you're developing these. So you don't have to have you know, 25 different devices while you're trying to develop. Uh, and one, one person I was talking to was actually testing wireless connectivity on their app by taking a phone with the app on it and going up and down an elevator uh, to simulate spotty wireless uh, while they're running the app. And so that's the kind of stuff we're trying to make so you can s sit down and <laughs> keep working. Um, yeah, in that same sort of vein, I, I guess it's more of a comment than a question, but uh, from user experience, <clears throat> excuse me, from a user experience standpoint, it's also a challenge to think about the context of someone using the device on one screen versus the other, you know, the whole like uh, 10 two yeah. or one ten two thing, are they, are they one foot away, are they driving in a car, yep. are they, you know, sitting at their desk, are they on a couch, so it's a very different context of yep. um, how urgent things are, or if they're just kind of watching an ambient, in, in an ambient way. Yep. Yep, yeah, I think that those are great points. I, you know, the context of how people are using the app is not just the physical environment the app's running in, it's also the world of the user. Uh, like, you know, are they giving a presentation to people right now or things like that? Um, and uh, yeah, that isn't factored well enough into the, into the run times yet for people to really take advantage of that. That's a good, that's a good point, yeah. Can I be bothered now, that kind of thing? Um, yeah. I had a question yeah. about um, data. So I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, flex, but 
uh, how how does Flash and and uh, Air kind of work together to represent data, and how can sure. you use that platform? Um, uh, you can you can use um, you can represent data in lots of ways with Flex and and uh, and, and Flash Player. It can be XML, uh, it can be HTML that you are parsing. Uh, it can be uh, raw data structures. So uh, the language inside is ActionScript, which is uh, the ECMAScript standard with some advancements, kind of like JavaScript uh, as well. And so you can actually pass uh, compressed uh, ActionScript data structures as well over the wire. Uh, what I was showing with node synchronization is using a protocol called RTMP, uh, which we've published. It's a real-time messaging protocol. You don't have to use that, but it's one way to uh, keep that synchronous connection going where anything's happening, it broadcasts events to everything else. Um, and that works with, uh, there's a free uh, backend called Blaze DS uh, that you can use with PHP or whatever else. It's open source and it's free. Um, and we also have something called Lifecycle, which is more enterprise scale uh, for handling uh, data uh, synchronization, messaging, integration with enterprise systems. So it's a very robust data model and very simple to connect. Uh, you can just point it to a data source web service, an XML file, whatever it is you're using, and uh, it automatically connects and, and uh, you can attach it to user interface objects. A simple binding. Yeah. On the uh, multiple screen notes demo you showed, is there any thought about also putting out a portion of that experience to a device that may not have some sort of Adobe technology on it, like a feature phone with just Java or something like that? I'm not sure if I heard, I'm sorry, I had to oh, when you, in the um, notes application you showed across different screens, is it also thought about being able to put some sort of experience on a device that does not have flash oh, or I see. air? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we're doing a lot of experimentation with, uh, with flash and air because we can actually move that technology forward too and make it consistent like we have across browsers and OSs today. Um, so that's where you see a lot of that experimentation going on. But yes, I think that applications built uh, with, with HTML, for example, I think is a, a great way to build these applications. Uh, Air actually has HTML engine as well as the Flash player inside of it. Uh, so you can use either one, you can mix and match, you can blend them together with each other. Um, so the main focus, in, in my view, for how to build these uh, is using web technologies, though. Uh, not using native code, not using uh, non-web technologies. Because I think uh, one of the great ways to get across operating systems uh, consistently uh, is using web technology. It's, it's uh, well exercised, well proven. Um, people are using it in, in browsers all over the world today. Uh, and that is enabling a revolution in how people are building software right now, um, away from kind of traditional, you know, specific OS programming. Um, so that's, that's the main thing that we're really focused on, is, is enabling that, both HTML and, and Flash. Uh, and so in Air, for example, we use WebKit, which is an open source HTML engine, which we're working on too and contributing our, our work back as well. And a lot of other people work on that, Apple and Nokia and, and others own oh, Google now. Any other questions? I think I'm over time now. So I really appreciate you guys coming. Thank you very much.